Forget it. Hold on. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 92 of Tuesday with Perry. We're going to get Perry on the line just a second. So we're going to talk about the debate, obviously. We were watching it together um, and texting each other, actually, not watching us together. Um, So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some other things happening in the Middle East. And I'm just going to ask him really quickly up front about uh, Hurricane Helene. He is in Florida. I want to know what happened in his neck of the woods, comparatively. So let's see if we can't get Perry on the line. How's it going, my friend? Um, obviously better than how it's going back in Connecticut. <laughs> uh, it's it's going it's going all right. It's going all right. Um, so I we we obviously heard about the catastrophic uh, landfall of Hurricane Helene, and uh, well, you're in Florida. I think you're in mid Florida, right? Uh, did you get right. affected at all by the hurricane? I, I guess it hit mostly Georgia and North Carolina. Yeah, actually, um, not my area. Keep in mind, Florida geographically is a big state. Okay, so my specific part of Central Florida, um, we we personally lost power. I was shocked. We lost power for between six and eight hours. We lost it at one. And um, at 7 o'clock the next morning, we still didn't have power. And I decided right, I'm still going to try and fall back to sleep. And when I woke up at 9, you know, the AC was not working. So uh, we, we suffered nothing more than power outage. And um, we had significant branches come down from some, some of our mature pine trees, even a couple of branches off of our oaks. Uh, but thank God... Um, nothing more than that. Now, going west to, let's say, south of St. Pete, and then following, and I'm talking about the Gulf Coast, taking the Gulf Coast from south of St. Pete, so let's say Sarasota. Sarasota didn't get really hurt that badly. But from Sarasota all the way up, as you move farther north on the west coast of Florida, uh, there was significant damage. Matter of fact, as of uh, today, the city of Clearwater Beach, which if you ever want to be on a beautiful uh, sugar white sand beach in Florida and have all the accoutrements of a cosmopolitan area, that's a town you want to try, which is Clearwater. Um, the mayor was begging people to not come down to the shoreline and the barrier islands because they had been hit really hard. As you kept going north, so you get to Tampa, Tampa had more damage. Right. And then it got worse and worse as you went up into the um, what we call the Big Bend, which is the crook of, of the state of Florida. That's where Perry, Florida is. And um, that's where the major impact, that's where landfall was in the state of Florida. And that area is completely devastated. It's been lost in the news because the real tragedy as bad as it was for Florida in that part of the state, the real tragedy was North of us because of the between 30 and 40 inches of rain that fell between North Georgia and North Carolina. And, um, there are still as, as we, um, record this show tonight, Rudy, there's over a million people between Florida and North Carolina or, or even actually, um, Western Virginia, Tennessee, are, yeah. right. Tennessee too, right. That are not only with that power, they don't even have water. Yeah. Uh, and they're cut off because the floodwaters of these creeks and rivers washed away whole towns. 
So well, as Joe, bad as it was for yeah. parts of Florida, it was nothing. Uh, we had storm surge. They had a once in a 500 year event that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Yeah. Yeah, well, apparently Joe Biden is sending in army helicopters, uh, dropping food and water. Um, yeah, he had to be told to do that by <laughs> civilians, yeah. you know, because, of course, we have helicopters for places like Rwanda to bring food, but we don't have helicopters um, here in this country that our tax dollars obviously pay for to do the same for American right. citizens. I just... Unbelievable. Well, apparently FEBA is busy uh, resettling migrants, and that's why they can't lend yeah. a hand in North Carolina. Yeah, well, that that would explain why all the people being interviewed between, and, and it didn't matter what the color of your skin was, it was um, it was a multinational or multiracial event, um, white, black, brown, yellow, all these people being interviewed. It's like, it's like we feel like we've been forgotten. We, FEMA? We haven't seen anybody from FEMA. And like you just said, now we know why. Because the priorities are to make sure those voters for the Democrat Party that Uncle Joe and and the princess and Tiny Tim can depend on get get their mail-in ballots so that they can vote before Election Day. Right. Anyway, um, right. it's, I'm just disgusted. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, it's, it's the same thing that George Bush during Katrina and, and whatnot – well, no, it's not. And I'll tell you why. Because George Bush had FEMA go in two days after the event. He didn't show up for four days. We're going to day six. It took five days for Kamala to show her, her puss. And now Uncle Joe is only now deciding, well, it's time for me to get off the beach. I've got my summer tan. I think it's time I, I take a trip down there. I'm sure they have a running water by now, so I can I can take a piss and flush it. <laughs> um, so we're going to move right into the presidential debate. Uh, we both watched it last night. Obviously, we were communicating via text during the debate. I'm just going to set it up, and I want you to give your, uh, your lowdown of what you thought happened there. But obviously... I knew, or I had a good feeling, since Maggie Brennan was not on Face the Nation this week, she was also preparing for the debate for five days. Um, So it led me to believe that they were, CBS was coordinating, CBS News was coordinating with the Walsh campaign, the Harris-Walsh campaign, and probably rehearsing. To, To me, it seemed like, just like with ABC, is that he had all canned answers and he knew exactly what questions were coming and how it was going to go down. I like what still fucked up. Yeah. I like what JD Vance did. Um, You know, we were a little frustrated with his mission, but he kept on mission. It was a conservative mission and I don't mean politically conservative. I just met in his presentation. He, He played the long game and he was, Focusing on wooing independence, uh, which was the mission. Uh, so and I'll, suburban women voters, right, and minorities, right. And so I think he did all that, and he softened uh, Trump's edges. Um, so he did stay on mission, although it frustrated the base uh, quite a bit. So um, why don't you start from the top? Uh, how do you think it went? Um. Well. You know, as as the game, and that's what this is, as the game moved forward, you know, I, I was getting frustrated. Uh, and it started at the very beginning. I mean, uh, the, the first question out of the box had to do with the Middle East, and then they forgot about it. And the second question had to do with global warming. I mean... Or, or, I'm sorry, it's been called climate change for the past 10 years. Forgive me. Um, and, of course, then they had to deal with abortion because that's not on the American people's minds right now. So we have to put it up there front and center for everybody to chew on. Um, and I, I just started getting more and more frustrated, as, as did you. And I thought, come on, J.D., just please put this miserable rabid dog out of his misery and bury him already. And I thought 
we had certainly won. There was no question by the end of this this fucking game that Maggie and Nora were playing. And, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, certain innings, like what they tried to do by cutting off J.D.'s mic, uh, we can get into that. But the bottom line is, at the end of the debate, um, you know, we go to the talking heads in the spin room, and what I found incredible was, I guess I was wrong. I guess you were wrong. The the goal was, as you just laid out, Rudy, the goal was not to keep us on on the team. They already have us, and we're we're sitting right now on the bench waiting to take our shot, you know, at bat. The goal was for JD to do exactly as you just explained to your audience. It was to soften the rough edges and the ruffled feathers that trumps, you know, uh, King of Queens attitude um, turns so many people off about. And so he, when, when, when I saw what all these liberals on PMS, NBC, you know, I forced myself to watch their shows. I went, I went to uh, um, Communist News Network and all of them, they were crying in their soup. Uh, you know, first of all, they were angry with little Timmy because he played nice. He didn't, he didn't try to cut JD's nuts off. They wanted blood and they didn't get it. And they were mad about that. And, and they were like, how in the world could you not be prepared for the question on what transpired all those years ago when you said you were in uh, Tiananmen Square. And he blew that. I wanted JD to bring up uh, the stolen valor because yeah. that's a big deal. And he didn't. And, you know, as it turns out, based on, and, and uh, you know, I paid attention to what Frank Lund said, basically, you know, this, Creature of the dial, um, he had of 12 people at the end of that debate, 10 had decided they're going to vote for Trump. Right. I saw that. That's a slam dunk. That's a slam dunk. Yeah. So it, it, it goes to prove I can't be right 100% of the time. <laughs> I thought it was a slam dunk as well. Um, it took me a little while to figure out exactly what was going on. So I want to go to a, pick out a few points um, that haven't been widely discussed yet. One was when they were talking about Obamacare. Now, what you said you saw and I've seen on the mainstream media on the left, particularly, is that they were talking about Obamacare and that how J.D. Vance said Trump made Obamacare better. And... The point about Obamacare is, of course, that the Republicans didn't get rid of it. And some people are happy about that and some people are bad about that. Uh, getting rid of Obamacare would have been uh, a nightmare politically for the Republicans, but they did what they needed to do constitutionally, which was get rid of the mandate. And it made me mad that the, that during this discussion about Obamacare, and he almost went there, it looked like he was like baiting uh, walls a little bit to go there because he was going to say, and I was hoping he was going to say, that the mandate, which was the only thing that they got rid of out of Obamacare, um, was unconstitutional. So the only thing they got rid of Obama, uh, from Obamacare was the mandate, which was unconstitutional. So I was a little worried that people didn't, haven't brought that up and haven't been talking much about Obamacare. I know it's a sore spot with some conservatives, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, whatever. Okay, you got government health care or you get government brokered health care actually is what it is. But the unconstitutional aspect of it was you don't have to join it. Um, right, but here's the problem with the fact that young people are no longer mandated to join it. We, you and I both know how actuarial tables work. 
and the insurance companies told Obama 10 year oh my god I'm sorry 12 13 years ago it's hard to believe the insurance companies told Obama 13 years ago when they were getting ready to pass it look in order for this to work we got to have all the young people between 18 and 35 enrolled and paying premiums because their premiums are going to offset the costs we have to absorb taking care of people in their 60s, 70s, and beyond. And yes, for those on your, in your audience, you're saying, Perry, what the hell are you talking about? Social Security and Medicare take care of people at age 65 and up. Oh, no, contraire. It only takes care of Medicare A, which is hospitalization. Right. Medicare doesn't pay for your doctor unless he's seeing you in the hospital. Medicare doesn't pay for your prescriptions. Medicare doesn't pay for therapy. Doesn't pay for any of those things. That's what you have Medicare B, C, D, and now E for. And that is covered through all the major health insurance companies. And what they were saying is, we can't afford to pay for these benefits and stay solvent if we don't have people that are paying premiums and don't need service. So the mandate was the only thing that made Obamacare work. Well, the because only that went away, well, because that went away, thank you, then all this magnets. Because that went away, they are now funding Medicare and, for that matter, even Obamacare because you have the indigent who can't take care of themselves and therefore we, the people, are paying for their health care. Not to mention the tens of millions of illegal aliens that have invaded our country. We're paying for that too, okay? In order to pay for all of that, they are stealing from other programs to offset the losses because the federal government, under the current law, can't fund Obamacare. Yeah. That's uh, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, they're, Correct. They're robbing those mortgage funds. So uh, what do you think that's going to mean? Right. <laughs> that's why they're trying to privatize uh, Correct. Uh, Freddie Mac, and which is actually is a good idea because it'll get the government's hands off that. <laughs> so. No, we'll just have another Amtrak. Right. You know, Amtrak is a semi-governmental entity. It's a corporation but it's owned by the federal government and it loses money every year and tax revenue has to pay to keep it going. And that's exactly what's going to happen with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We're going to have to keep putting tax dollars into it to keep it going, even though it'll be semi privatized right. because something has to pay for all these benefits. Right. So let's, uh, let's move on a little bit. So you did touch on this a little bit, which, which, which wrote, it really made me quite mad, pissed me off quite a bit, is the fact that they brought up abortion and climate change. Climate change, as I mentioned in my podcast this morning, isn't even registering that's uh, right. uh, that's on, right. on issues. So why did they bring it up? Is because it's a leftist issue. They didn't bring up, um, you know, I can't think of a conservative issue. Well, they, uh, didn't, they didn't bring up censorship. Taxes. Yeah, censorship. censorship. Right. <laughs> and, right. JD had to bring that up. Right. So, right. so they didn't bring up any any uh, conservative issues. They brought up, brought up the liberal leftist issues. Um, they did talk foreign policy quite a bit, and I want to get into that and the border. Um, and then, but they didn't talk about the increasing risks uh, of World War Three that Donald Trump brings up all the time. Ukraine wasn't even mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And like I said, the first question out of the box, okay, I'm sure the girls said, let's get this bullshit out of the way once and for all so that we don't have to come back to it during the next nine, uh, 88 minutes. Let's talk about what's happening in the Middle East. One question on the Middle East, and that was it. Right. And by the way, that was after over 200, and, and I know the official count's 186, but 
uh, Fox News had this guy Cohen, who's an American-born Israeli citizen. He uh, he worked in intel uh, Israeli ID, um, special forces special intelligence, ops, yeah. like my buddy, who whose name again remains uh, uh, anonymous. So he said there were over two hundred. Uh, ballistic missiles that were launched. Now, that's a big deal for every American and every American family. Why? Not because it's the Jewish state, it's because it's an ally. We launched hundreds of defensive missiles from our Aegis cruisers in the Eastern Mediterranean to sh help offset what the Israeli forces weren't able to get to, okay? And neither one of these dumb twats thought it was important to have a real discussion about, well, what does this mean for the American people? Right. I'm not saying we should go to war to defend Israel. Israel can take care of itself. But I wanted to have a discussion. I wanted, I wanted to draw the parallel between how we're going to do whatever it takes to destroy Vladimir Putin, but we're going to tell the Israelis, no, you can't do that. And that's the exact reason why Iran did what it did last night. Okay, we can talk about the Israelis. Once again, the Mossad, you got to give them credit. If, 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 you're, <laughs> if you're a member of Hezbollah and you still have a beeper, you're as dumb as a box of rocks because obviously um, Mossad has has fingers uh, much deeper in international electronics than any of us thought possible. With all those beepers that went off, and it, it decapitated the entire organization of yeah. Hezbollah. Yeah. And so um, I was really upset that there was no discussion about that. And I was even more outraged about how they wanted to address the issue of abortion. And I'll, I'll give uh, J.D. some credit, but I won't give him as much credit as he thinks he's, he deserves on how he handled that matter because he was put on the defensive. And when Tiny Tim said, you know, started throwing out names of women that had to drive six hours, he said 11. It doesn't take 11 hours unless you're going by horse-drawn carriage. Uh, six hours to get from Georgia to, uh, he said North Carolina. I don't know if it was North Carolina. It doesn't sound like that was right. But anyway, my point being, this poor woman, young woman, decided to end her pregnancy. She couldn't get an abortion in the in, um, state of Georgia because they have um, restrictions so she had to go to another state and for some reason and nobody questioned him on this and this is again why I got upset a little bit with JD so you're telling me Tim because this woman chose to end her 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 child's life because it was obviously later in, in, in the gestation period she had to travel further then why didn't she stay overnight in the care of a doctor to make sure before she left that everything checked out? If she died because of the trip coming home, obviously it was hemorrhaging that caused her death. She didn't, and she didn't get the proper care. She didn't get the proper care when it was performed. Now, as tragic as that is, Tim, why aren't you equally concerned about the eight documented infant deaths that took place in your state under your governorship when you changed the law in the state of Minnesota to make it legal to let a child born alive during an abortion die on the table. Isn't that equally as tragic to you? That is a human life. And you denied that child a chance to live. That's barbaric. Yeah. It's all, I guess it's all in the timing. 
Well, it, it, you know, there's, I felt JD may have been over prepared, over prepped. You know, there was a lot there for him to, to unwind last night. He still did a, a super job. Don't get me wrong, but I wanted someone to, to defend the child. And to, more importantly, to call Tiny Tim out because he lied when talking about that. Now, of course, J.D. did call him out on the actual legislation. And when, when, when Tim said, you're lying, said, okay, then tell me where I'm wrong. And that's when it was either Nora or Maggie wanted to change the subject. Why? Of course. They know why. We know why. And J.D. should have held it. He should have said, no, why don't you give him a chance to answer? See, when it comes to the issue of abortion, we still haven't learned how to fight the good fight. This is the reason why it's happening in my state, Amendment 4. I don't know how well Amendment 4 is being challenged in, inside the electorate. You know, we've got 33 days before the election. We start going to the polls, I think, next week, early voting. So where, where is, there's a couple of commercials that do run uh, on, on TV, but I don't see an organized effort to call into question what this proposed amendment says. Everything in the advertising for Amendment 4 in the state of Florida is about saving a woman's life. Well, wait a minute. It says that there should be, there should not be a restriction as to when an abortion can be permitted. So basically it's abortion, not only on demand, but up until the ninth month, that's what's in this bill. And my whole argument is that's the way I feel. J.D. should have prosecuted that question. He should have hammered them on that. Look, any abortion is tragic. Any woman that has to go through it, my heart goes out to you. It's a very, very difficult decision. But at a certain point, and this is what he should have said to Tim, he should have said it to Nora and to Maggie. At what point do you think it's no longer a fetus? Huh? Yeah, he oh, was. That's not your dis- that's not your decision, Tim, because you're not a doctor. So what you're saying is, children that are born in the fifth month or later, because for whatever reason, the mother's uh, body is rejecting the baby. Can that baby at, at at 20 weeks now can be saved? So you're telling me that at 20 weeks it's a child because the woman wants it. But because the doctors are telling the woman at week 35, because I think gestation is 38 weeks, at week 35, uh, we just did a test and, uh, geez, you know, the chances of your, your baby surviving are, are minuscule. You may want to consider aborting this, this fetus. So in other words, what was a baby at five months is no longer a baby at eight and a half months because the mother no longer wants it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that is what you're saying. Let me answer it for you. But again, that wasn't his job. Right? Yeah, that wasn't his job. He was on mission and it took us a while, especially in the base, to figure that out. We were grinding our teeth or gnashing our teeth and we, we figured it out going in. And when, I think I figured it out pretty well when he got into censorship. And he brought that about. He pivoted really good in a bunch of different situations. Yeah, he did. Yeah, uh, he did. And so when they were worried about democracy and they brought up uh, January 6th, which is a, another thing, it's another leftist story, another leftist narrative that they had to push that, right. um, you know, why are we talking about this still? I thought it's already been prosecuted. They're trying to prosecute you know, you obviously heard about Jack Smith with new charges Brent coming down today after right. J.D. Vance's win. So we know it's politically. Well, well, not only bringing it down, not to interrupt you, but let's also point out 
old Jackie boy got the judge to say, yeah, we're going to also release most of what you want the American people to see before the election. And oh, by the way, Trump and Trump's legal team is still under a shutdown. Right. They're not allowed to say Jack, excuse the pun, Jack Smith about it. Yeah, yeah well, but he did pivot well on that and he went right to st- censorship, which is a greater threat to democracy than whatever the hell they were talking about. So uh, I like the way he pivoted and then he, in his closing statements, uh, he continued with that, which I think was a good idea because I think he lulled the independents and the suburban women and then he just made the point of how important uh, government censorship is. Excuse me. Well, there, in, in my opinion, based on what I saw from the talking heads on the other channel, based on how my X feed was blowing up from the liberals that I end up, for whatever reason, algorithms, I get their feed. They're all crying in their soup today because their guy failed miserably and our guy convinced a lot of women. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And hey, this, this, this guy is not the monster we were told he is. Right. He, he, he just did a great job. My, um, well, what I also liked is that JD brought up inflation when they were talking about the economy um, because they didn't talk inflation. They just talked about the state of the economy and he had to keep bringing up Kamala Harris's inflation and Kamala Harris's economic policy. And then on the border, um, they, uh, Walls kept trying to deflect that the border, that somehow this bipartisan legalization of illegal immigration somehow was, you know, uh, was even an option. It is definitely not not an option. And I was also right. I was also mad at JD for not explaining the bill. Uh, my wife was actually going ballistic, saying, "Explain the bill, explain the bill." Um, but he didn't go there. He stayed on message, and I think they had rehearsed it out pretty well. And his whole mission was to be appealing um so going for the jugular i think was not on the agenda and it it may have been on his agenda but it wasn't on team trump's agenda and again when you're running as vp you do what you're told as by the way as was timmy boy he did what he was told basically well he tried anyway don't fuck up. Just go out there and don't fuck up. Which he did. Which he did. Which he did. You know, oh, I'm a knucklehead. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that gives me reason to vote for you. Yeah, yeah. you're a knucklehead sometimes. Right. You're also a fucking liar. Yeah, and he's a friend of school shooters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if you had a chance to catch this tonight. Um, Jesse Waters, I think it was Jesse. It may have been Lauren Ingram. There were um, there was a small gaggle of, of reporters that cornered him in New York City last night after the debate, or maybe it was today. And they asked him, one, one reporter asked him basically if he would like to clarify his statement on being a friend of, of school shooters. And he didn't even look at them. Yeah. All the man would have had to do is turn around and say, you know, I deserve to be a butt of jokes for that. But you, every one of you standing here knows what I meant to say. I flubbed it. I take, I take responsibility for flubbing it. But you know I meant to say I have become friends with the surviving family members of the victims of shooters. You know. He never said that. No, he didn't. He uh, ignored yeah. the question. Yeah. Now, and he talked to, I, they, ha- they had another shot of him. I think it was, I forget where it was in Pennsylvania, where Fetterman was standing behind him. I saw And he just talked around like, the question. Don't you say something stupid now. Because <laughs> even Fetterman with his stroke is still smarter than uh, Tim Walls. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I never thought. Fetterman would ever be able to put a sentence together, let alone two sentences. Yeah. 
Um, but well, we're not, we're not, has, yeah, we're not taking it out of context, by the way. We knew that these are gaffes, but these are pretty big gaffes. Right. And, and it's, look, we're all capable. I, I've done it on your show. I've made mistakes and I, in mid sentence, have to say, oh, I, I meant to say this. We're all human beings. Sometimes we, as the great Rush Limbaugh used to say, we all have a moment of diarrhea of the mouth. And our lips move faster, or I should say our brain moves faster than our lips, and, and, and therefore we get tongue-tied. That's all he had to say. Now, on the issue of I was in Tiananmen Square, that's a whole nother story. That was a whole nother story. Yeah. And um, look, we don't have to go down that path anymore with regard to Tiananmen Square. What I would like to focus on when it comes to his lies, let's talk about his stolen valor. Yeah. And that was something I felt J.D. missed, missed on. He could have said, you know, Governor, as a fellow veteran, I just want to thank you for your service. But one thing I can't forgive you for is misstating the fact right. of what your rank was. But that was not the mission. And, and the fact is the Correct. moderators didn't bring it up. And even the federal the Federalist had an article today saying how come that wasn't brought up. It should have been brought up. And the fact is, is why is the question about China should have been is with all your connection with the Chinese government, is that going to prevent you um, from being tough on China, which we need to be? Um, because a lot of people think that he's a Chinese spy. So before I just before we end, I want to go uh, back to the Middle East for a second. Do you have any other uh, quick comments about um, well, the debate? Yeah, I do. I, um, about the debate, um, let's let's just leave it where where we are. We're we're all on our team. We're all relishing this moment in the afterglow. We're enjoying it. Tomorrow we have to pick up where we left off last night and keep attacking. Um, but it was a good night and let's just leave it at that. Yeah, it was a good night. And of course they had to, you know, their retort was bringing more trumped up charges, pun intended, um, because it is the federal government that is being weaponized uh, against Donald Trump. We Everybody sees this for what it is now. So I don't think them going on with it is going to be very effective. And it is election interference, as Alina Haba said, um, because he could have brought these charges after the election, the new charges, because we're not going to see them pan out anyway before the election. So before we, I just want to leave on a note on the Middle East. So I don't know if you heard this reported. I believe it was six or eight Israeli soldiers were killed by Hezbollah. I did. Yeah, uh, yeah, in the Golan. I think it was in the Golan, but in Lebanon. Um, yeah, and during their operation there. And I just want to remind people, and then I want your thoughts on this, is that Hezbollah is not Hamas. I mean, they the Israeli army could deal with Hamas very effectively, I believe. Um, it's more like a knife going through butter. But Hezbollah, not to hold Hezbollah up to any uh, higher regard, but they're a, a more effective and a better trained fighting force uh, than Hamas. Well, you also have to understand that Hezbollah was formed out of the Iranian Republican Guard right. in the early 1980s. They were the ones who were exceptionally well-trained and took out our Marine barracks in Beirut. 83, right. In 83. They had been training since 1980 or 81. Certainly no later than 81. So Hezbollah has been ra around and exceptionally well-trained and equipped since the early 1980s. So there's a huge difference from a standpoint of organization. And they are every bit, maybe even worse butchers 
than Hamas, and that's saying a lot, okay? They are the reason why there was a Lebanese civil war back in the 70s. They are the reason. Yep. And, um, you know, most people don't know that in the 1950s and 60s, Lebanon was a, a multicultural state or country, just yep. like Israel is. But as more and more radicalized Muslim, because there are a lot of Muslim, they get along with everybody, everybody. But the radicalized Muslims were the ones that carried the stick. Yep. And little by little, their population increased, and then they started demanding things of the Christian-led um, government and ultimately overtook the government during the Civil War yep. and that of the ni early 1970s. And that is what allowed the Ayatollahs in the early 80s, 1980, 81, to start properly training and providing weaponry to Hezbollah. And why? So that they could, from the north, attack, attack Israel. This was the thing I was most concerned about a year ago. We're coming up on the anniversary, first anniversary of, of, of the war. And I, I said to you and your audience, my concern is if BB doesn't deal with this quickly, and I was hoping three months, no more than six, this, is, this war is going to widen. And there's going to be a second front that will be open. Well, it's happened. Now it's a full-fledged war. And this is the reason why these six Israeli soldiers were killed, because they're having to do in southern Lebanon what they have been doing for the past year in Gaza. They have a whole network of tunnels there. and Even more sophisticated, yeah. Correct. And, and, and more fortified. And and so that's the reason why these is real, and there'll be more casualties, unfortunately, yeah. because when you go into the rat tunnels, the rats don't play nice. Yeah, and what people don't understand also is there is a partnership between fanatical Islam, not just Sunni, but particularly Shia, Correct. and aligned with the liberal left globally, even in the United right. States. And so that's, people wonder why, you know, oh, Obama gave the Iranians this and Biden's giving um, Hamas this, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to Hamas and then giving hundreds of billions of dollars back to Iran um, because they like to control the criminal element. They not only were controlling uh, Iranian fighters, but they had a deal before the, the coup in Saudi Arabia that Trump helped broker that they were controlling the Wahhabists also. So right. th uh, people don't understand is that you think, yeah, these Muslim countries, they have all the wherewithal to go around and start killing people. I mean, the most powerful Muslim country isn't even Saudi Arabia, it's Pakistan. They have the biggest army they have nuclear weapons. They have nuclear weapons, right? right. And, and and people don't know. And people don't know about the uh, alignment between Pakistan and China. You know, there's a lot going on between, and, and that's what people don't make that connection. I'm not going to take it any further, but I appreciate your insight into what's going on in the Middle East, particularly in Lebanon. A lot of people don't know about the civil war there, and that about how it was a multi Lebanon was a multi ethnic, multi religious uh, European. Western society. It was the most Correct. most European of all the countries there uh, between uh, until Syria helped get the Shia Muslims in there and disrupt the whole fight. And it's a very complicated issue. I don't want to go into it now. I'm actually going to cut it there, Perry. I know it's a, a, just a short time tonight, but I appreciate you joining me and talking about uh, the debate in particular, but also these developments in the Middle East. Well, you know what? As always, Rudy, it's, it's a joy, it's a pleasure, 
Um, and hopefully we're, we're serving a purpose by, by having these great um, uh, conversations between two good friends. Yeah, absolutely. I think so too. So, and feel free, uh, join me every morning, uh, Monday through Friday, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Rumble, where I go live with my daily podcast, Rudy's Revelation. Thanks again, Perry. I appreciate it. Hey, Rudy, thank you for, for allowing me to get on my soapbox once again. And here's to us having another great conversation next week. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I love it, man. I love it. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> All right, buddy. See you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Well, there goes Perry. Episode 92 of Tuesdays with Perry. We had a little short special edition of Tuesdays with Perry on Wednesday. Uh, The debate went a little late yesterday. So we decided to wrap it up tonight in a nice little bow. Talk about the debate and the wonderful debate performance, which was expected by J.D. Vance. But we figured out what the mission was. He was going to play it soft and cordial and civil and to try to win over those independents and those suburban moms. Thanks for joining me today. Don't forget to join me Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. on Rumble Live. And we'll see you next week for episode 93 of Tuesdays with Perry, where I hope to see you tomorrow morning. Peace out.